Hey friends, thanks for joining us today uh, for this service. We're really glad you're here with us. Hey, we have a lot of things that go on here at Christ Community Church and we would love for you to be a part of it. So you can head over to our website at cccgreeley.org. Um, check out the upcoming events. There's also groups that you can become a part of. Um, and we would just love for you to uh, enjoy things throughout the week as well. So um, be sure to like and subscribe so more of our content comes into your feed. Um, also check out our podcast that we have on our YouTube channel channel as well. We would love for you to be a part of that. Um, but we hope you enjoy the message today. Hello, Christ community. So glad that you are here. Uh, I'm Pastor Allen, and I'm just honored to be here and sharing with you today. Today, we're actually beginning a five-week teaching series that has been stirring in my heart for a number of years, but then four years ago, it kind of went to a whole new level um, as I watched our nation go through a very contentious election, and I saw firsthand the damage that happened as a result. Families being torn apart, churches being split, friendships disintegrating, and even the testimony of Christ taking a huge hit by the way some Christians were engaging in politics. And I just knew in my heart there has got to be a different way for us as Christ followers to engage in politics so that it doesn't become this polarizing, emotionally stressful, relationally destructive experience. And so as I pondered that, what seemed to be lacking, what seems to be lacking is a biblical framework that we can use to approach these things. And so in the midst of lots of reading and listening and praying and processing these things, I feel like the Lord led me to a particular passage of scripture that gives us this framework that we can use to help us navigate these things. And I, I intentionally wanted to do this series now because I want us to be prepared for the intense political season that will soon be upon us so that we can respond in a way that, that honors Christ and his heart. Now, I, I realize that some, some of us here, some of you may be thinking, look, I came to church to get away from this stuff, and here we are focusing on it. Look, I get that. I totally get that. But here's the deal. Our relationship with Jesus should impact every area of our lives, including this area, all things with Christ, right? We talk about that a lot around here. We need to hear God speak to us. So that we, about, about how speak to us about how we can live purposefully in the culture in which he's placed us so that we don't simply blend in with our culture, but instead we live differently. So what does this different way of living look like when it comes to the arena, the area of politics? Well, if you have your Bible or Bible app, feel free to turn to the book of James chapter three, where we see the answer to this question. And just to set the context, James is writing to a group of Christians who are experiencing difficulty and persecution as they're living in a culture that doesn't necessarily value what they value. And so in the midst of this letter, James challenges these Christ followers to live differently than the world around them, by embracing this incredibly powerful thing called wisdom. See, wisdom is not the same thing as knowledge. As a society, we have tons of information. We have tons of knowledge, but we don't necessarily have a lot of wisdom. So in James chapter 3, verses 13 to 18, James unpacks for us what godly wisdom looks like. And in doing so, he actually gives us this biblical framework for how we as Christ followers can engage in a politically charged environment like ours and honor Christ in the process. Now, look, I realize there may be some of you here who are thinking, I'm just not into politics. It's, you know, it's kind of a mess and I don't really see the value of it, you know? And, 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 there, and there may be others of us here or others of, of you here who are like, bring it, come on, let's do something. And, and look, here, here's the deal. This passage, this passage in James speaks to both of those perspectives and everything in between. So wherever you are coming from, I want to invite you to open your heart and your mind to this passage and let's let God speak to us from it. What does godly wisdom look like 
in the midst of a politically charged culture like ours? Well, what James initially does is paint this stark contrast between the wisdom of the world and godly wisdom. So let's look first how he describes the world's wisdom. James 3, beginning of verse 13. Who is wise and understanding among you? Let them show it by their good life, by deeds done in the humility that comes from wisdom. But if you harbor bitter envy and selfish ambition in your hearts, do not boast about it or deny the truth. Such wisdom does not come down from heaven, but is earthly, unspiritual, demonic, for where you find or where you have envy and selfish ambition, there you find disorder and every evil practice. Notice how James characterizes the wisdom of the world. It is all about envy, selfish ambition, pride, hatred, relational dis disorder. And this so accurately describes our political climate right now, whatever side you're on. What well, what James describes here is the kind of stuff that permeates political rhetoric. This is how candidates raise money. This is how news websites increase traffic by stirring up these very things, anger, hatred, relational disorder. And we can easily get sucked into that atmosphere, which according to James is not an insignificant thing. James calls this approach demonic. It is evil. Anything that stirs up this kind of stuff is not from God. And it is not a way of living that any follower of Jesus should be cultivating. Okay, so what is the alternative? Well, James tells us in the next verses, he clearly lays out for us several characteristics of what godly wisdom looks like. Let's, let's read this out loud together, okay? Here we go. But the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure, then peace-loving, considerate, submissive, full of mercy and good fruit, impartial and sincere. Peacemakers who sow in peace reap a harvest of righteousness. See, there it is. That's what biblical wisdom looks like in any situation, including the politically charged cultural moment that we are in right now. This is how God calls us to live. He wants us to embrace and live in a wisdom that comes from him. A wisdom that, as James says here, brings peace and reaps a harvest of righteousness, which is exactly what our nation needs. See, the wisdom James describes is not passive. It's not weak. It's powerful. James is saying that by following biblical wisdom, we can be change agents in our culture. So over the next five weeks, we're gonna dive into this passage and explore five specific characteristics of godly wisdom that are articulated in this passage. And we're gonna apply this to this cultural moment of political polarization we find ourselves in. And let me be clear here. This is not about me telling you who to vote for. It is not. This is not about this reductionistic, oh, Christians should always vote this way sort of thing. No, biblical wisdom involves us learning how to think deeply about issues and how to respond in a way that honors the Jesus that we follow. So today, we're going to look at what James says is the first and foremost characteristic of godly wisdom. And we're going to apply this to the realm of politics, okay? James says, verse 17, but the wisdom that comes from heaven is first of all pure. So what does this mean? The word used here for pure is the Greek word agnos, which means holy, in the Bible, the idea of holiness often referred to something as being set apart for God's purposes. So what James is saying is that a wisdom that is pure is a wisdom in which our lives are completely and totally aligned with God's purposes. They're fully aligned with God's values and God's heart. In other words, it means that our ultimate allegiance is to God. To be a follower of Jesus means that every other love, 
every other commitment, every other allegiance takes a back seat to our allegiance and our commitment to him, period. See, this is the foundational issue that permeates the ministry of Jesus and what he's calling his followers to embrace. So it started with the very first words Jesus used when when beginning his public ministry. So check this out from Matthew chapter four. First public words, here they are, verse 17. From that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of God of heaven has come near. So Jesus begins his ministry by talking about a kingdom, a new kingdom that has now arrived on the scene. Now look, make no mistake about it. The language Jesus uses here was politically charged language. In a context where Caesar ruled as king, Anyone promoting another kingdom would be viewed as a threat to Rome. And it it was actually a threat to Rome, but not in the way people thought. See, many people interpreted Jesus' words about this kingdom to be describing a military, political kingdom that would overthrow the Roman government. But Jesus wasn't interested in establishing that kind of kingdom. No, Jesus had his sights on a much more substantial, much more impactful kingdom, one that involved a radical heart response. Look again at what he says. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. What What does repent mean? It means to completely change the orientation of our heart. Jesus is calling us to turn our hearts toward a different kingdom, a different king. See, from the beginning of his ministry, Jesus is letting us know, he's letting us know that being a part of his kingdom involves giving our total allegiance to him as king. Okay, starts off with that. First message, giving our allegiance to him as king. So then... Matthew describes two specific things that Jesus does to begin moving this kingdom forward. First of all, he calls a group of disciples to follow him. So in the very next verse, Matthew tells us about Jesus walking along the the Sea of Galilee, and he calls Peter, Andrew, James, and John to leave everything and to follow him. So notice, Jesus is intentionally, immediately, and intentionally creating a new community a group of people who will embrace and align their lives with his kingdom. So what this tells us is that the primary way Jesus is planning on impacting the world, the primary way he's planning on impacting the world is through a community of people who are living according to his values, who are aligning their entire lives under his lordship as king. See, Jesus didn't come to earth to get elected to a political office and bring about his kingdom through legislation. He didn't. Now, this doesn't mean that politics is bad or evil. No, we're, we're, later in this series, we're going to talk about God's purpose for politics. But what this does mean is that Jesus' primary vehicle for advancing his kingdom and for transforming a society is not government. It's the church this community of followers who have fully aligned their lives with his kingdom. So this is the first thing that Jesus does after announcing that his kingdom is here. He establishes a kingdom community that is all about him as king. What's the second thing Jesus does? He immediately begins to describe exactly what it looks like to live in this new kingdom community. He basically unveils the founding documents, the constitution, so to speak, for this new kingdom. In the very next section of scripture, Matthew chapters five to seven, Jesus clearly lays out for us the values and the behaviors that are embraced in this new kingdom. We call this section the Sermon on the Mount. In in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is saying, Look, I invited you to this kingdom, kingdom of heaven's here. Now here's what it looks like to live in this kingdom. Here's what it looks like to be a part of this kingdom. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. 
Blessed are the humble. Blessed are the peacemakers. Be known for your good deeds. Love your enemies. Be generous. Pray to your heavenly father. Avoid the destructive power of anger and lust. Don't judge people. See, in these three chapters, that's just a sum of what he says, but in these three chapters, Jesus is clearly laying out for us exactly, exactly how he wants his people to live in this new kingdom that he's establishing on earth. Everyone in this new community is voluntarily surrendering themselves to him as king. And they're voluntarily aligning themselves with the values of his kingdom as he describes in Matthew 5 to 7. So let's apply this to the realm of politics. If we are people of his kingdom, that means that he is our king, period. He is the one we ultimately surrender to above any other allegiance or loyalty. Our ultimate allegiance is not to a political party, nor is it to a particular candidate. It's not even to our nation, even though we may love our nation and are so grateful for the blessings of living in this country. The foundational question is, who has our ultimate allegiance and loyalty? Who has preeminent place in our hearts? I saw a banner flying outside of someone's home not long ago. It had the Christian fish symbol and then the words American Christian. And I thought to myself, you know, the order of that is interesting. Are they an American first and then a Christian? Or are they a Christian first and then an American. See, this is not just semantics. This is a question of what loyalty comes first. See, what happens, for example, what happens in this person's heart when an American value contradicts a value of Jesus? Who wins? And if we think that American values and Jesus' values are always perfectly in sync, we're not reading our Bible very closely. Again, we can love our nation and appreciate the freedoms that our nation enjoys, but our nation is not perfectly aligned with Jesus' kingdom So, in the values of his kingdom. And so when it comes to a situation where the values of Jesus contradict the values of our nation, which side do we choose? Who ultimately determines the values we will embrace? Our nation or our king, Jesus? The apostle Paul says this so clearly in Philippians 3.20 where he writes, but our citizenship is in heaven. The Greek word he uses here for citizenship, it's a political word. It's the word polytiuma. It, it, it's a word from which we get politics. Paul is saying that our ultimate allegiance is to Jesus, not to our nation, our political party, or whatever other group or podcaster we identify with. I pledge my ultimate allegiance to Jesus. I align my entire life with his values over and above anything or anyone else. This is what it means to be a follower of Jesus. This is what it means to pursue pursue a wisdom that is pure. It means that our hearts are fully aligned with Jesus and his kingdom. His kingdom is our ultimate allegiance. Okay, now this is where it gets a little tricky because for, for many of us, May we, we hear this and we think, of course my allegiance is to Jesus. I'm a Christian. Of course my allegiance is to Jesus. But I, I want to explore this a bit more deeply because the reality is even the most devoted of followers can drift from this, especially in the realm of politics. One of the most vivid biblical examples of this happens with the Jewish chief priests who are urging Pilate to crucify Jesus. 
they wanted to get rid of Jesus because he was a threat to their political power. Now listen, this is really important. Jesus wasn't crucified because he preached about forgiveness of sins. He wasn't crucified because he preached about loving our enemies. No, Jesus was crucified because he claimed to be king. And that claim was a threat to the powers that be. So the chief priests realized the only way they could get Jesus crucified was if they could get Pilate to do it, the Roman governor of that region. So they, they suddenly find themselves using political means to get their agenda accomplished. And look, I'm sure they've figured the end, look, the end justifies the means. Let's use the power of it. Let's use political power to get what we want done. But in that process, something very significant shifted in their hearts. As Pilate, you can read about this in, in, in John in chapter 19. As Pilate is hesitating to do what they want him to do in terms of crucifying Jesus because he, he doesn't feel like Jesus is capital of, you know, guilty of a capital offense. As Pilate is doing that, the chief priest's anger intensifies. And so at one point, he's going back and forth inside, talk to Jesus, come back out, talk to the chief priest. He does, you know, he's doing this. At one point, the, 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 their anger intensifies and they're at their, as they're shouting at him to crucify Jesus. And so Pilate, he goes out and he asks them, shall I crucify your king? Look very carefully at how they respond. We have no king but Caesar, the chief priest answered. Think about that. These are the chief priests. These are the top religious leaders in the Jewish faith who had given their lives to follow the God of the Old Testament. Rabbis would often begin a prayer with these words, blessed are you, Lord our God, King of the universe. These chief priests had prayed that prayer hundreds of times. They were committed to following God as king. They taught people to worship God as king and Lord. And yet here they were publicly declaring, we have no king but Caesar. Here are these spiritually devoted leaders who in this political frenzy of fear and hatred set aside their allegiance to God in order to get their agenda accomplished. Now look, did they consciously know they were doing this? I don't think so. I think they got so caught up in the intensity of the moment and their own agenda that they lost sight of what they ultimately valued. Look, friends, in a politically charged culture like ours, our hearts are so vulnerable to exactly the same thing where we can allow ourselves to be caught up in the angry, intense political rhetoric all around us. And just like the chief priests, our hearts shift in terms of what they are ultimately trusting in, in terms of whose values they're ultimately following. And what, what, makes, this so, what makes us so vulnerable to this is that these are things, these are issues that we really care about. Right? We care about what's happening in various areas in politics, all that. We, and, and that's okay. That's good. But it also, because we care about them so deeply, it also makes us easily swayed by the loudest or the mo most per persuasive voices around us. And we don't even realize it's happening. We don't even realize it's happening. I, at times, have heard Christian leaders who when talking about Christians being engaged in politics, they will use the example of Nazi Germany to urge Christians to not be silent and to take a stand. And if we don't take a stand, evil is gonna prevail. And look, I, I hear that, but what I've never heard mentioned by those same speakers is the fact that in the 1930s, most of the church in Germany was in favor of Nazism. This wasn't about Christians being silent. It was about Christians who allowed their heart loyalty to shift and to be swept up in a sort of nationalistic pride. 
which ended up rendering the church powerless because their ultimate loyalty had shifted. When we allow our hearts to begin trusting in political power over our allegiance to Jesus, our ability to impact society with the power of Jesus is significantly diminished. Now look, there are so many other examples in history I could give of well-meaning Christians being seduced by political power and losing sight of their moral compass, their ultimate allegiance. But let, let's, just, let's just bring it home here. Let's be honest. The human heart is very vulnerable to shifting our ultimate loyalty and allegiance when it comes, when it, when it, when it becomes personally advantageous or politically expedient to do so. I mean, the human heart is very vulnerable to this. Now, now look, please hear me. I'm not, I'm not saying Christians should not be involved in politics. I'm not. We're going to spend the next four weeks looking at what wisdom tells us about how Christ followers can engage in these things. What I am urging us to do in this first and foundational message is to honestly and continually look at our own heart and to ask this question, where is my ultimate allegiance? Is it solidly rooted in the kingdom of Jesus or is it being swayed by other perspectives, by other loyalties? I mean, this is a really important question, friends, really important question. This is not just a theological question. This is a heart question. This involves us looking honestly at our own hearts to see if there are any other things that are becoming more important, more influential than Jesus in our lives. Okay, so let's get practical. How can we explore this in our own hearts to see if this is happening? Well, here, here are some questions that I've been thinking about. How much time do we spend watching and reading political news and political commentary on television, YouTube, or our news feeds compared to how much time we spend focusing on the Lord in prayer, worship, and the word? Which is shaping our hearts more? Here's another question. How much time do we spend in our relationships talking about political things compared to how much time we spend sharing with others what God is doing in our lives? See, how we spend our time is one measure of what our heart values. Another way to explore our heart's allegiance is to look at our emotions. Do we find ourselves on a roller coaster of emotions depending upon the latest polling data or news from that day? Do we find ourselves increasingly angry about political things, getting all worked up? Do we find ourselves in despair if an election doesn't go the way we wanted? Do we find ourselves increasingly discouraged and overwhelmed, anxious about the state of the world and wanting to avoid thinking about any political topic or issue? Do any of those responses reflect the heart of a person whose confidence and trust are solidly placed in Jesus as king? What about the area of our passions? What are we most excited about? What do we get most passionate about? Latest political news? Or the presence of God moving in our midst, healing people, loving people, setting people free? Are we more animated and passionate in a political conversation than we are in a worship service? See, these are all questions of the heart. These, these are all questions we need to continually be asking because, again, our hearts are incredibly vulnerable to shifting our allegiance, especially, friends, when everything around us is trying to pull us into this polarizing, fearful, angry, or passive vortex. In the passage that we're looking at today, James says that wisdom is first of all pure. It is holy. It is fully aligned with Jesus and his kingdom. So the, the way of wisdom urges each one of us to continually and honestly look at our hearts and to ask, where, where is my ultimate allegiance? Who or what is the primary influencer in shaping my political perspective? In what or whom am I placing my ultimate trust? 
If the answer to those questions at any given moment in time is anything or anyone other than Jesus, we're missing the primary call of Jesus on our lives. His invitation to us is the same as that day in Galilee when he began his ministry. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. Now, we usually stand at this moment, but I I want us to remain seated here and to enter into a space of stillness, of prayer, letting Jesus speak to us about our hearts, about our allegiances. So I invite you to close your eyes just right where you are and quiet your heart. Holy Spirit, come. So I want to invite you to imagine Jesus is standing in front of you looking at your heart. What does he see in terms of your ultimate passion, your ultimate loyalty? Are there any things that have become more important to you than him? Are there any places where your ultimate allegiance has shifted to something other than Jesus? And if so, I encourage you in these moments as Jesus is there, he's looking at your heart and you're seeing your heart in his presence. If you see and if I see any place where our allegiance, our heart allegiance has shifted, let's just confess that to him. Say, yeah, Jesus, I see it. And I want to offer to you my full allegiance. Yeah, let's just let him minister to our hearts and us to him. What what is he saying? What is he pointing out? And what does it look like to to give to him our ultimate loyalty and allegiance? Jesus, I pledge my ultimate allegiance to you. Just express to him in the quiet of your heart, just express to him your heart's desire. And Lord, any places would you continue to reveal to us as we walk with you, any places, even in a moment in time where our heart's loyalty is vulnerable to being shifted in the the frenzy of a particular moment or in the midst of a passionate thing we're feeling, we're Whatever, in the midst of all these things, God, would you gently remind us of where our ultimate allegiance lies? We love you, King Jesus. We love you.
So we're gonna continue just in an attitude of worship of this King. And we invite you to stand, sit, you can kneel. And as a part of this time, as we, we often do, we try to do it every week, we wanna invite you, if, if at some point the Holy Spirit is stirring in you, or maybe you're just wanting someone to pray over you and to bless what God's doing, and if they have a, a word, they'll just listen to God on your behalf and share with you what they think the Lord might be saying, something you can test and weigh. If you want that, just come up front. We have a full team tonight, to, to right now, so we would love to pray over you. I'll be available as well. So you do, if that's you, as, you're, as we're worshiping, just come forward, just stand up here, and we'll, we'll come alongside and, and do that. So Jesus set us free to worship you right now. As king, we love you. You are a king who is worth following, who is worth giving our all to follow, who is worth giving our, our ultimate allegiance to. And so we worship you as king. Thank you, Lord. So wherever you are coming out of today's message, we just want you to know that you do not have to journey alone. We would love to chat with you, pray with you, walk alongside you in whatever God is doing in your life, and we want to hear about it. If you hop on our website, there is a little chat button in the lower right-hand corner. Click on that. Somebody is on the other side that would love to talk to you, pray with you. Uh, also, feel free to email us, um, and we are available. So we encourage you to do that and we hope you have a great rest of your week. Bye.